So I would like to welcome you to the most interesting panel for this global gathering. And we have here uh, myself. So my name is uh, Mohamed Mustafa Fall. Uh, I'm the center president of M Senegal and a German research chair in mathematics and its applications. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Sophie Dabo Nyan from France, Professor Samuel Mwali from Kenya, and uh, Professor Buba Karpa from Gambia, who is the German research chair in data science also in South Africa. So uh, welcome everyone to, the, to this panel. Thank you, Mustafa. I'm chair of uh, the Committee of Developing Country of European Mathematical Society. I have a PhD in statistics a um, long time ago, in 2002, at University Paris 6, named Pierre and Marie Curie, now uh, Paris Sorbonne University. I'm working on, um, as you say, like I said, statistics, but I'm specialized in spatial, high-dimensional statistical model. My PhD was done on on uh, big data. It was at the beginning of uh, this, uh, say, when people was talking about big data. Uh, was um, and I, I can say 20, 20 years ago. Uh, then I work on functional data, meaning data of big, like very, very big or infinite dimensional space. So at that time, I just was very, very theoretical. I was focused on uh, estimating regression or density function or distribution uh, with um, of processes in very high dimensional, like Banach spaces, metric spaces, etc. And then after my PhD, I was interested to, let's say, to correlate some of my work with real problem, real society problem. Then I began looking at some interesting, um, let's say, cases to work. And then I discovered spatial statistics. Discovered that spatial statistics come from Africa. Uh, and then since then, I, I used to uh, apply a lot of my theoretical model to spatial data and then to real problem. Uh, thank you very much, the Professor Samuel. Thank you so much and everyone, uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Samuel Mwalili. I'm a professor of statistics at Jomkitara uh, University of Agriculture and Technology. I'm also an adjunct professor at Stratmore University, where I did a center for health analytics and disease modeling. I did my master's and my PhD both from Belgium, that is uh, Hasselt University, and also Leuven University, both in Belgium. Then after that, I left and joined the Center for Disease Control, uh, that's the US Embassy in Kenya, where I've worked for eight years. And that's where now my interest for disease uh, came in, because I was actively involved in HIV, that is a national estimate, where we're estimating the burden, the impact, uh, and the need uh, for HIV models and things like that. So after that kind of way, I turned myself into a disease modeler where I did uh, some trainings, both at Ibirio College in London, I think twice, and also at uh, Institute of Disease Modeling in Seattle, US, where I've been also trained on disease modeling. So by my training, my initial background is about statistics, but the time went on over time, until I crossed to applied mathematics, where now I'm bringing a lot of disease modeling. Here in Kenya, I've been involved in the COVID-19 modeling, where we have been advising the government on measures to take, I think like that. So I think uh, I'm a transformed person from statistics uh, to applied mathematics. Thank you very much, Professor Sam and Walili. So before, uh, so I continue, so I introduce myself. So me, uh, my work, I, I am more specialized in, uh, in somehow pure mathematics, but in the last years, I am uh, interested more in modeling complex systems such as uh, so disease modeling and, 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 and problems from social sciences. So it is an interesting subject uh, somehow uh, that describes uh, systems uh, using mathematical concepts and languages. And of course, maybe as you have heard, maybe you have seen, so they, have, they find applications 
in many, in normally in real life, so in natural science and social sciences. So, in the case of infectious disease, so mathematical models in general can project how infectious disease progress, show the outcome of an epidemic, and help inform public health for intervention. And uh, mathematical models can take many forms, so they can be dynamical models, statistical models, differential equations, and even sometimes strategic, so using game theoretic approach. So they are, uh, in general, people are motivated. So the motivations, in, I believe, in, in, in starting mathematical modeling, mostly they come from somewhere. Uh, sometimes people may change, but sometimes people may rest, or maybe some people start from pure mathematics and go back to mathematical modeling because they find sometimes it more interesting. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, the numbers uh, since the outbreak, so since the beginning, uh, so we have uh, around uh, 23,000 papers, uh, COVID-19 papers. So, 23,000 at least. So, this is a huge number of papers that people are publishing uh, and uh, it's, it comes almost every day. And of course, uh, what is important here to know is what is the papers that are that will be useful, that will impact the real life, and those which are not. Uh, so in this, uh, so here we are going to talk in will our talk, so our our presentation, so or maybe our discussion will be focusing on uh, so how can how these uh, all these research papers will impact maybe our real life. So publishing a papers and impacting are two different things, and so I think one of the uh, one of the most interesting uh, applications, perhaps in mathematics in the real life, where people are saying maybe this is not the case, is the one-child policy in 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 China, uh, in which which was based in a very naive mathematical models, in which uh, maybe it was decided after a certain point to decrease the number of the growth of the population in China that, uh, that, uh, that, that we, one has to have, so every woman must have one child. So, and the consequences are terrible. So there are advantages, but still there are drawbacks. So simple mathematical models, which I can say is the, the the easiest one which would be say okay so if i if i know my position and my velocity then i can know uh, then i can know my position in all time so this is the simplest mathematical models that uh, that that maybe every student knows uh, but there are of course more difficult models and we have specialists here in this stage who can uh, provide us with more uh, more complicated but still useful mathematical models so let me just start uh, uh, so with uh, Professor Samuel M. Wally, uh, M. Wally, sorry. So uh, maybe to provide us uh, an overview of the contribution of mathematical sciences in disease prevention. If you are, if you can also maybe focus in Africa also, that would be very good. So thank you, Mustafa. And uh, welcome everyone on board uh, to this uh, forum. Yeah, this is our forum where we are discuss, going to discuss more about uh, mathematical models and sciences. And I think actually Mustafa has given a very wonderful background where he has said actually uh, mathematical models can be both dynamical, it can be stochastic, can take any form, even sometimes including uh, pure mathematics. So that there is no uh, distinction in what kind of mathematics is going to take. Now, actually, I want to first emphasize the importance of mathematics in disease modeling. If you remember when uh, COVID-19 came, of course, uh, from December uh, last year, uh, around, I think, February or January, WHO issued guidelines on how to conduct ourselves or to do business in this time. And the question is, I the very first question, I believe everyone was, how do we estimate how many people are affected, maybe the first 10 days, first 100 days, and so on, how do we estimate the peak of epidemic, how do we estimate uh, the time when this epidemic will end? And those are the those are the major questions. And I believe the beginning of modeling, actually much of it was done even at the time with Ebola. Actually, that's why we had a lot of models that came to rise. But I think as Mustafa has alluded, there has been many models now 
than any other time for COVID. As he has said, we have about 23,000 per application, and I believe more on COVID. But the question is, now, to answer some of these questions, what tools do you need? And I can tell you, mathematics has come at forefront. I think this time than never before. And before I talk from a global perspective, I would like to give a, a Kenyan experience uh, what actually we did in Kenya. I remember when COVID came, around December, I had a training on mathematical modeling in our country at Jom Kenyatta University. And uh, in January, I had a small team of mathematicians that we came together. And I remember one of them asked me, uh, Prof, can we do something? That time there was no COVID in Kenya, there was nothing happening in Kenya, but we decided let us form a modeling group. It was quite amazing. Around February, uh, I got a call from CDC Nairobi asking Malili. I remember actually I was working CDC, so I just resigned. I just resigned from CDC uh, from last year. Then they asked me, "Are you doing anything on modeling?" Actually, I was surprised that I was ahead in time with my team because we had prepared a manuscript even before the very first case in Kenya. And therefore, they called myself and my team and we formed a national uh, team in Kenya that was to advise the government and the ministry of the measures to take. And I remember the very first question was, what would be the impact of uh, non uh, non interventions in Kenya? If, for example, we close the schools, uh, the government imposes the curfews, the government imposes travel restrictions, what are the impacts? And quickly, I just remember when I had some call with the director at Ames, and I think also some people in Tanzania, we had a call to discuss what are we going to do. And I remember at that point, we decided let's run a quick uh, model uh, to answer this question because there was no information, there was not much uh, to know what to do. And I believe that's where I started, I started seeing the power of mathematics. Of course, that was not the beginning of where I saw the power of mathematics. But at that point, I saw the power of mathematics because this is a government, these are the medical doctors, these are policy makers who are waiting for someone to give them direction on what, to, on what measures and intervention uh, to take. So what I can say actually, mathematical models have been there, but I believe in Africa we have not utilized mathematical models. And let me just uh, go back to my experience, as I said, I was working in CDC as a senior statistician in Senda at uh, the Division of Surveillance and Epidemiology, where I was earning good money. But I decided to resign because in the first 10 years, much of the modules that were done uh, for HAB were done by guys from Ibidio College, people from New York, uh, and from other countries. And I was there trying to say, hey guys, can we have modelers in Africa? Can we have modelers in Kenya who are going to model HIV dynamics in Kenya? And I can tell you, for the last 10 years, I did not succeed. I decided to resign myself and form the team now that's going to agitate for modelers in Africa. And even now, we are trying to talk to the government with the National Health Control Council to see, can we have Kenyans who are going to model HIV? And I think, actually, thanks to COVID, now the government has realized in Africa, there are mathematicians, there are people who can model disease. And I can tell you, uh, it's only in South Africa where they have succeeded uh, to do their own models, for example, for HIV. In Kenya, we still use Spectrum, we still use UNAIDS, we still use uh, WHO. And I can tell you as I speak now, this week we had a, a seminar in Nairobi uh, on uh, UNAIDS models uh, to model the HIV dynamics in Kenya. You see that they're called Naomi, uh, which is developed by uh, UNAIDS. And to me, I'm not opposed to UNAIDS, I'm not opposed to Naomi models, but I'm thinking it's high time we have our own homegrown model. And I think the question is, over the many years, why don't we have homegrown model in Africa or, or in Kenya for that matter? And I think the problem is the disconnect between the academics and the research. Because when you go to class, what you teach is purely theoretical. Of course, I know the trend is changing now. Actually, I've seen in a mathematical department uh, from last year, they have started changing now and embracing the fact that we can move beyond the classroom and join the industry. So I think in my uh, part in short for now, maybe I'll come talk uh, later. I think what we have, and now we should, we should, I think the aims should even aim at doing, 
is to provide a forum where we are going to have a disconnect from, a, a mean connection, sorry, between academics and industry, so that whatever we teach is relevant. Because to me, I believe, even if I prove the theorem, the theorem, I show stability analysis, I do all those kind of things, this equilibrium, my dynamic equilibrium, it's good for academics. But how do we relate that to reality? How do we model our own diseases, the TB, HIV in Africa? Of course, I know we get money from UNAIDS, we get money from WHO, we get money from CDC, but I believe it's high time now we dictate, we dictate our own course because I've been there working with the CDC, the American government myself, and I can attest, unless we take our own stand like South Africa, and say, oh yes, guys, we appreciate your money, but let us, as Africans, model our diseases. Let us understand our dynamics, because I believe we have enough knowledge and we have enough capacity to, to do that. And I think this is a good forum now, like what we are doing now, to showcase. And just uh, to, to wind up, I can say, for example, like uh, through that initiative, last year, actually, I, I did uh, something called the uh, model transmission in Kenya. So I was given the contract to the model expert to model the mode of transmission in Kenya, which has never been done by a Kenyan, it has been done by people from Western. And that was good, actually. And this is something actually that can also help. Even you can try to do for other countries so that you can do the mode of transmission of HIV and other diseases without necessarily being done by individuals from Western world. So there is power in mathematics, but more so. Thank you, uh, so Prof. Mbali. So uh, it is an interesting point. So that you are also here that you have been doing mathematics. Uh, data analysis and also working with decision makers. So this is an important point and uh, so I think we'll come back to this uh, later on. Uh, so Bubakar, so please can you quickly uh, introduce yourself and also uh, just maybe tell us uh, your research work quickly. Uh, Okay, I sincerely apologize. My internet is really, really bad today. Um, uh, I'm Bubba Karba. I am uh, based in Ames, South Africa. I'm the Ames, uh, the humble research chair, or German research chair for mathematics of data science. Uh, in my previous life, which I still live, I guess, I was doing uh, uh, mathematics of signal processing, compressed sensing related research. And I'll probably mention a bit of that because it's related to how do you use mathematics also to prevent disease. So currently we work on different uh, questions around machine learning, data science, and, and, and deep learning. And we're interested in both theoretical questions, the mathematics that try to understand, make us understand how these algorithms work, and which we can give rigorous guarantees why they work the way they are working. And also, but also we want to apply it to real life problems like the problems come from agriculture, or health, or energy. And uh, these are some of the problems we're working on right now. Uh, thank you very much, Bubaka. So, uh, so we were in the subject, we were talking about uh, mainly, uh, so about uh, the participants in this panel to provide an overview on the contribution of mathematical sciences for disease prevention, in particular in Africa. So we, there will be no problem also when you focus, if you focus also in the field of research, or maybe if you can also, like Professor Samuel Mwalili, so maybe if you have worked with decision makers or anything, so just to give a quick overview of uh, how do you see the contribution of mathematics in uh, disease modeling. So, uh, I will just uh, give the question directly to Professor Sophie Dabo. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, okay, I I'm going to talk about a field I know very well, um, namely spatial statistics. To a few words before um, saying something in this field. So, I can tell you that African scientists always made um, important contribution to mathematical science. But I think that we have problem in Africa to highlight uh, our contribution. And even African, African mathematicians, they do not know that uh, we, in Africa, we do excellent work in, in, in mathematics and namely here in, um, um, in, disease, in disease modeling. 
Um, a, very a very simple example is um, when you do uh, disease mapping or diffusion, modeling diffusion uh, among countries or neighborhood, uh, cities, etc. So using the time and space is very important. And in this field, um, Africa, the first model was proposed in Africa. The first model was that of Krish uh, in Virginia in South Africa. Uh, let's say at the beginning of the 16th, he proposed a very efficient and simple model, prediction model named Krigging, based on a very naive um, idea, taking a mean and then weighting the mean uh, based on some proximity. And he proved that the, this prediction was the best, um, let's say, linear predictor available um, when you support that your, your data is Gaussian. And among the more than 20, 23,000 papers on COVID Mustafa talk about, some of them are dedicated to um, diffusion modeling, modeling the diffusion of, of the, the disease and also mapping the disease. And most of them use spatial statistics. And nowadays, even in uh, big data problem in machine learning using kernel method, uh, spatial statistics is used, namely this screening prediction method, even if data are not have not a spatial component. So the prediction of Krish, the prediction model of Krish is used. And this is not, sadly, this is not known in Africa. In the other uh, countries, it's well known and used every, every day. Um, and I can say proudly that uh, some of the modern technique in statistics, when you have time and space or only space components, they use spatial statistics and then they use the work from Africa. And this is typically an uh, excellent example to say that um, um, African scientists always contribute to mathematics, but this contribution that we decreased a little bit because we did not have enough let's say, support from the government, from the politics, etc. But I think that we do not need to, to wait from support of, from the government. We can have initiative among us to be able, um, let's say, to, to have a contribution, strong contribution like developed country. So thank you, Sophie. So uh, maybe you say something. So I learned something. So the first model is from South Africa. So this was related to the mining. So I think this is so I will do more research and reading about this. Uh, so uh, indeed, so I think you are completely right. So Africa, so there is a contribution from Africa, of course, uh, perhaps not enough, or maybe some are well known, or maybe even some disappears over time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much and uh, so maybe we'll deepen some of the points that you raise uh, which are interesting and which are related to, uh, uh, to funding uh, because when we talk about contribution to contribute you need of course something that allows you to contribute. Uh, so Bubakar, uh, so can you also yes. provide two input. So yes, I, I would take this uh, broader definition of modeling, just like you said, not limited to, to PDEs, right? So in signal processing, people are working on things that are useful to help prevent diseases, okay? So I, I worked on compressed sensing, like I said before, and one of the big successes in this century on the application of mathematics to real life problems could be compressed sensing. Uh, so, like uh, techniques, compressed sensing techniques tend to reduce the sampling you need to do to be able to recover the signal. So that's the whole point of compressed sensing. And the idea has been applied to uh, machines that scan uh, for diseases in people. So in tomography, in MRI scanning, and all these other techniques, they use comp now they're using compressed sensing techniques. And what does what that gives us is that we are able to reduce the time that you need to spend on that MRI machine, for instance. So MRI scans may uh, take up to, let's say, 45 minutes with the commute compressing techniques now, 
the new, newly built actually, um, I think uh, uh, there's this German company, I, I'm trying to remember now, Siemens have built this new uh, compressed sensing uh, using a MRI machine that uses compressed sensing where now patients this, this time is caught to have, like instead of four to five minutes, the patient just needs to stay 20 minutes under the machine to take a very uh, diagnosable image. So this is a contribution that uh, is, 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 is uh, the mathematics is behind this contribution because most of this was was, was uh, rigorously proven that actually you can do this kind of sampling technique where you take fewer number of measurements and with guarantees, mathematically rigorously proven guarantees, you can recover the signal. So if you're taking an image of a brain, it's your guarantee that your PT, the solution is unique, okay? It exists and it's unique, and it is the image of uh, the brain that you are taking, not somebody else's brain, okay? This was useful. Although engineering were getting results, it was comforting to have the mathematics to back the, 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 the founding of these solutions. And recently, of course, uh, which is close to home, you will see this new uh, group testing technique that is used used in, in developed in Rwanda by colleagues in Rwanda in Ames, which uh, actually got them uh, this nature paper. Where actually they're using mathematics again to show that you can do pool testing instead of testing one individual, you test many individuals and you reduce the number of test kits you are supposed to use. Okay, this has the compressed sensing idea flavor where you're taking fewer number of measurements, and we are also working on this. A lot of groups are working on this. And this is also a clear contribution of mathematics in to towards uh, disease disease prevention. Uh, I think those are two examples I, I want to give. Okay, so thank you uh, indeed. Uh, so there are a few contributions, but something that I I notice and perhaps you all notice is the is this number this difference between this huge number of papers on modeling. It can be HIV, it can be Ebola, COVID-19, whatever. So there are thousands of thousands of papers. Uh, so which, and almost all these papers write in their introduction that uh, our that our our results is can be used can be used by decision makers uh, maybe to to do something or to see something. Of course, I agree. So maybe as uh, Professor Samuel said, also it was very interesting during the COVID nineteen outbreak that uh, the mathematic the mathematicians were somehow predicting predicting the next peak. So I think this is all. This was almost everywhere in the world. And in many cases, I think uh, the, inter the interval of tolerance was very small. So in a sense, it was perhaps it was quite well known. And some people, they use uh, differential equations. Some other, they use, uh, uh, they, they use uh, machine learning approaches and, and other tools. And all of this so was really a, a, a great, uh, made a great impact. But still, it seems uh, there is a huge number of Publish the papers, all motivate it uh, by resolving or maybe by understanding some problems of disease. But out of thousand, maybe one or two only will come and give impact in uh, in, in the societies. So 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 with this, uh, so how how do you see all this uh, difference between uh, between the, how do you see this gap? So between this huge number of published papers and those which have impact. So, uh, Professor Samuel, so you have already been working with uh, in both uh, in both places uh, the, the academic world and also interacting with the with the with the with the healthcare system. So, what would you what would you tell about this? Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Actually, you have asked a very broad question. Yeah, because we have churned so many papers, and the question is, there are some papers which are going to be useful, others which may not be useful in the public. Actually, what I can say, like uh, with COVID, COVID is a special case, because I remember, if you write a paper, for example, in COVID, a text log, for example, in your desk, then if you send it for publication, that would be published, because already it would kind of have passed uh, the test of time. And actually, that's been the challenge with the COVID, because uh, I remember, the initial papers were on uh, non pharmaceutical interventions like uh, washing hands, uh, social distancing. So those papers today, people are not reading them much and they are concentrating on other things like uh, need to do with the second wave uh, and, and so forth. 
I think what I can say, there has been a lot of publication, but actually, as we have said, only a few, or handful, will be useful. Because I remember, like, my case now, my initial publication was very general, just SIRA model for COVID-19, which was there to serve some purpose. But now the focus, as, as time went on, uh, narrowed uh, to either cut the specific paper, either address the issue in Uganda, address the issue maybe in South Africa. So as time went on, people uh, the focus now remained on papers that are more specific to a particular country. And for example, like let me give you case of, of Kenya. Then the Kenya went down now to addressing issues, regional issues, maybe talking about Nairobi, Mombasa. If today we talk we produce a paper talking like about Kenya as a country, it would be meaningful. But now we are focusing down or small area. And I think as uh, uh, Sophie has pointed out, actually there's a lot of interest in papers that are with spatial models, whether it's mathematical modeling or statistical models. And these are the papers which are now become very important today because we want to know where is the disease now and what the impact of the disease in a particular place. Because, for example, uh, if you want to predict, and the government, for example, is interested with, for example, how many ICU beds do I need? How many ventilators, like for COVID, do I need? How many uh, PPEs do I need? And those models must be spatial and structured by region, by geography. And I think to me, those are the ones which are making sense now, uh, the models which are gen general. Because we have very many mathematicians which have done a good job, I do admit. They have done some nice publications, but which do not connect with the reality. Because just do there, your audience show stability, show some nice mathematics, which to me is good for academic. But I think when it comes now to the actual implementation by the government, they don't connect. And I, and I think that's where now we have uh, many problems. Because, for example, like my, myself now, like for coffee, I've written like five papers. And I think uh, with my colleagues, four have been accepted and two have rejected. And like the one which I've rejected, when I checked uh, closely, I found that we are too much mathematical in that point. And most journals at the moment, they don't want to care too much about the mathematics, but they're looking more on the implementation science. How much is your work useful on the ground? How does it help a medical doctor there, a health policy maker there, who is making a decision? Maybe uh, as a party show, just to give an example, like uh, last week, I was with a director of health in Kenya, and he asked us, for uh, example, now tell us, tell us about the herd immunity. Do we need vaccination in Kenya? So can you go and model a scenario to see, to see that? So that before even think of ordering the, the vaccines from US, do we really need it? Are we going to reach herd immunity in Kenya? So those are the kind of questions now that are more interesting. So, so uh, Mustafa, just to hand, I say, there are many papers, yes, but I think any paper not focusing on the policy now, I don't, to, to me, I think that's not interesting uh, to the government. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much. So, Sophie, what do you think about this? Uh, this, this, this. Uh, can you add? Do you have something to add about what Professor uh, M. Walili said? Yeah, uh, Samuel said a very interesting thing. Um, one point uh, is that. Okay. Um, he said that our contribution is very important and large, right? but we have a problem of disconnection from the reality. I think that this is a very old problem in mathematics. Um, as you say, we can publish very high quality, excellent quality papers in very high um, standard journal, journals, etc. But we need to to work with other, other fields, other disciplines, like uh, during the, uh, the outbreak, um, in our team, some research that worked uh, was with, uh, with some, some colleague in biology, some physicians, etc. not to publish paper, but just to say, I'm here, I have some knowledge in statistics, in computer science, etc. What do you need in the hospital? What can we do to help you? They have some, some real question, they have the available date, data, and they ask a specific question and then we use our we, we use our our methods and uh, and then we build some 
just um, some, some results just to help them for a specific case, not to do a publication or something like that. And I think that this is very difficult uh, for us mathematicians to work with as a discipline because we do not have, let's say, same vocabulary, not say same objectives. And if we would like to be at, um, to have impact, to, let's say, to apply our results to, to real life and then have impact in the society, we need to discuss with other, other fields. This may take time and sometimes not fruitful for our research, but I think that this is important. Just to give an example, I start working with some colleagues in biology and uh, some physician uh, several years ago, let's say at least five years ago. Nowadays, we do not have any publication, but we are working with, um, with some, some startups, some company in the industry, just to build a tool able to correlate um, cell uh, characterization by cell using mechanical characterization, physical characterization, and biological characterization, and to be able to say one day, okay, if we use such tool, um, build with um, the startup and the industry, we are able to detect if a cell gonna be gonna have a metastatical potential or not only using physical characteristic and not biological characteristic because this takes a lot of time and is very expensive and then perhaps we got, we're going to have some results in 10 years or less than but this may take time may be fruitful or not but we need to do that i think and uh, we need as you say mustafa we need grants we need money to do that but we need also mathematician to go to talk about to talk with other other um, other researchers in other fields but things are are going better i think because if, if you look at I, I look at the the number of um let's say author in mathematics um and i compare um what happened um during the 16th if i look at the annals of mathematics the average number of poster per paper was uh, 1.2 in, in the 16th. And now it is almost uh, 2 in the, um, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And I'm sure that if you look at um, last year, then we're going to have uh, the average will increase a lot. So thank you, Sophie. Uh, can you just uh, repeat? So you mean uh, the contribution of researchers from Africa is 1%? Oh, no, oh, sorry. Just, I, I said that if I look at the annals of mathematics. Ah, of the annals, the annals, okay. Mathematics, sorry. And I look okay. at the average number of also per paper. In, okay. uh, in the 16, it was 1.2. Right. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So, so that mathematicians are, 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 yes, mathematical committee is, is yes, is, talk, is now talking with other, other, other scientists. Yes, I completely agree. In fact, uh, I think maybe at some point we have to simplify our language in order to talk to the other people. Uh, so uh, I completely agree uh, about that. So, Bubakar, so uh, in your case, uh, do you have challenges when you talk to people in industry or maybe, uh, or maybe other people outside of the mathematics world? Please repeat that, Mustafa. Uh, so I can I repeat? Yes, please. I missed the question. Okay, so I, I want to I want to know. So in your case, are you are a data scientist uh, also specialized in uh, complex sensing and doing machine learning? So can you do you have uh, in your, are you, do you have challenges? Uh, so uh, when you talk to people. So outside uh, the world of mathematics, I mean, people from industry or maybe in the healthcare system and so on. Yes, um, we do have challenges, of course. Um, uh, there is a difference in cultures, right? The academics and the other people, like people in industry, people in, uh, in, 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 in the medical field. So we, we luckily we try to do applications in healthcare, and 
applying some data science algorithms to try to do predictions of diseases and stuff like this. And yeah, um, one thing you will find with industry is uh, practicality is important. So as an academic, sometimes you work with a nice, this nice, everything, the data is well clean, and then you train your models, it's working. When you get to industry, this is different. The data is dirty, you have to clean it up. It is not as, as, as practical as you think it is. So it's more complicated. And then you have an extra layer for industry is that they have timelines. They have to produce a product for the client, you know. And this is not a culture for the for, for us as, as academics. All we work here is probably the publication. But no, they don't worry about the publication. They want this thing to work so that they could sell something to their client. So you have this pressure coming from the industry when you collaborate with them. And you, don't, you need to understand uh, they're from where they are coming from for you to work together. Yeah. So these challenges we do have. And in terms of Africa, if you zoom things back home, like, you know, data science cannot work without data. So in Africa, most of the time, the problem is with regards to good data for particular applications that we are interested in, like in health and other places, this is not the case that uh, they have for other data, like data in, in social media data and stuff like which is available everywhere, no. So the health data, you don't get sometimes the data you want in most hospitals in Africa. In, in the same thing in agriculture, you cannot even talk yeah, about data. The same thing when you go to talk to people in education, for instance. So data is a problem. And the idea is how do you develop methods to collect very meaningful, useful data? Because these prediction models depend a lot on the quality of your data. So this is another challenge that we face in Africa as, as people that work on, on data. A bit of a comment to the earlier question you raised about lots of publication being published and then few only making significant uh, impact. Well, I think uh, we should all agree that uh, the, the currently the publication method or publication system is 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 hugely inefficient. Uh, the it's 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 been now the university culture that people should publish. I I, I hope. People should quite interrogate these things and find ways to, to, to improve this. But uh, one thing that Sophie mentioned that was important is if you are at a state of your career where you can forego publications and work on meaningful solutions for people, this would be fine. But not everybody has this privilege. And you know, at some point, you need to have the numbers so that you get promoted or other stuff. And then one thing, though, that is it's not all negative. It's, it's, uh, so sometimes research uh, is, is incremental. Okay, Somebody writes a paper and somebody writes a paper that follows of that paper, there's an excellent improvement, but then eventually this can uh, inspire somebody to make a bigger discovery somewhere. So the pile of papers that lead to that are not counted, but they have contributed in some, uh, in some way, I think, too. So yeah, that was just a side comment uh, I, I have, yeah. Uh, so thank you, Bubaka. In fact, yeah, indeed, uh, this is the case because uh, uh, most, of course, most of the mathematical models that people are studying comes from uh, or different original ideas or different uh, models, maybe that have been say maybe improved, or maybe sometimes there are epsilon changes, of course. Uh, so you have touched also an important point, which is the data collection. Uh, as far as I know, and even personally in my case, maybe when we come back to this, uh, when we come back even to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, so the main problem, as in my opinion, uh, for those who are doing a deterministic model are the problem of calibrating their models because of the lack of enough data uh, or maybe data that were not collected in a, in a, in a way that can be also used. So uh, uh, perhaps, uh, so maybe, uh, and I, I can maybe uh, so give uh, maybe Sophie, maybe if you can, uh, if you have some, uh, some, 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 some input about this, uh, then why so do we always so mostly in Africa I think this is difficult that we know for different reasons but this is always a challenge uh, to, 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 to have uh, enough data or maybe even uh, data that can be used in order to calibrate the models that uh, like uh, me or maybe Professor M. Walili are studying. In Africa, data is a problem. The main problem when we would like to pass from theoretical model to application. I think that we can use um, some international initiative to collect data in Africa. I, I remember that during the last 
two ones. I number at least three uh, international initiatives for Africa by NEH and also by European Initiative, uh, permitting some colleagues, colleagues from Africa to collect data. And you can have a lot of money for that because we know that it's very difficult to have data. Data agencies in Africa, they're afraid of sharing the data. Perhaps also we can, let's say, um, go and see them and um, discuss with them and um, show that we can bring added value if we use their data. And they, this perhaps may permit some local collect on some data. But I think that we need also to do everything more um, to collect our own, to collect our own data. data. Yes, indeed, this is correct. So, Professor uh, M. Walili, so do you have uh, do you have uh, input to give? I believe that maybe you have faced also these problems of uh, having accurate data that allowed you maybe to calibrate your models. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Mustafa and Sophie. I think I'll approach from uh, two perspectives. First, I'll talk about the models. Actually, with the models, what happened, for example, like COVID. Actually, one major problem like COVID, we realized uh, the initial models were come from China, were come from uh, Europe. Uh, uh, so initially, there are no parameters for Africa. Actually, there was a paper by Parit at all, a paper by Pangason, which, for example, became the reference point uh, for parameter estimates. So that's one uh, problem because uh, most of the papers uh, that or data that we have never came uh, from Kenya for that uh, for that matter. So maybe commenting on the issue of data, what I can say in Africa, we have data. We are rich in data. What we lack, and our major problem, is uh, data, data uh, harnessing and uh, storage. Because, for example, I was uh, working at Gemri, where uh, I was collecting data, and we have a lot of data for research. But the problem is, for example, at Gemri, we have a lot of data. Every data belongs to a PI. So, for example, you may have like a thousand and thousand of data set in Kenya, belong to PI, others become people to the development agencies like CDC, others for the government. But the problem we have is data honesting, data warehousing, data storage. We have no common source of data. Mm -hmm. So, sometimes I remember you can go to a ministry, for example, in charge of uh, census or something like that, or survey. You go on the data, they can give the data, but that data is not documented at all. You don't know what each variable is sent. They just dump it there. It's just a database, like either, either in whatever format it is. So I think what we lack now, and I think as Sophia said, it's a call uh, by NIH for data for Africa. And I think also there's a call for, for regional data in East Africa, Central Africa, which NIH has put. And I believe this will solve part of our problem because we can have a better honest way better stock data in africa otherwise in africa we have data but data which is never stored neither here nor there so we don't know how to find the data mm. so i think we have a major major problem for now thank you and over to you thank you indeed yeah so this is a serious problem data storage uh, so, uh, when I was lastly also working in mathematical modeling related to COVID-19, so we were, we were trying to optimize so somehow the number of beds uh, that maybe the government would need to set in order maybe to be able to, the minimum bed, of course, that one would need in order to, uh, uh, so in order to, 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 to take care of the, of, the, of the increase of the pandemic. But it was difficult. So at the beginning, so the data was uh, public, but then in the end, you don't see anything. So you have to call and people will tell you, maybe I think maybe this is the number of beds that was done. And the issue of the government, for example, like Kenya, the government relies to model COVID or any disease, but the government will never release some data to you. For example, they said like the data of migration is something that belongs to the Ministry of Security, and therefore we cannot access it. They can give data of the cases, but they'll never tell you how many people are negative. So it becomes very difficult for analysis. Uh, thank you, and over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, indeed. So uh, maybe before, uh, so maybe we talk about a possible uh, 
uh, possible uh, uh, ways maybe to overcome all these difficulties uh, that we have uh, because uh, you know uh, the contribution the, the contribution of mathematician of African mathematician in the whole world it's almost around one percent so it's or even less so it's uh, so this is a question maybe that we will that I want to maybe you maybe to say something about this but before that so I would like to take uh, one question of Mustafa Jolade so graduate graduate student Imperial College of London so he's asking a question uh, which is uh, what research efforts are being directed towards pandemic prediction in the mass community so uh, if you maybe any one of you can just uh, take it uh, maybe quickly and provide answer if uh, yeah yeah thank you Mustafa, for your question actually about uh, i think what Mustafa is talking about is uh, like a real time projection or prediction of pandemic in africa uh actually what i can say Mustafa, just was your question and i think as uh, i think some of you are new and i think also Mustafa here is that mm -hmm. we, lack, we, lack, we lack money we, we are just like the funding to support that exercise because we, we went now funding somebody can invest time and do those kind of models but i believe now with the aims and with other groups we can have coordinated efforts so that we can build models that can do if not in your time but almost a weekly projection of diseases over to you Thank you very much. So, uh, Sophie, do you have a uh, few words to say? Uh, so, about uh, maybe how uh, do we overcome all these difficulties about to make Africa to contribute more in the worldwide research? Okay. Okay. Just some 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 words. I think that we need to expand collaboration and communication among African African mathematicians, but also with other fields um, regarding the data. We health, the health data uh, may be constructed by researchers, I think. And we have many initiatives now. I think that NEH has a lot of money and no one to submit proposal in Africa. Lastly, uh, two days ago, there was a deadline for NEH with almost $7 million just to construct a health data. I'm sure that uh, I think that one initiative coming from Kenya, I know, perhaps one from uh, Ivory Coast, but they did, not, they did not succeed to submit the proposal, but a lot of money to create health data. Up. And then in collaboration with industry, uh, with uh, researchers in Africa and worldwide. So I think that we need to do that. And don't, do not uh, just stay and... Um, ask politics, I think that we do not have to wait for politics to do that or for regional data agencies to do that. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Bubakar, quickly, so we have almost one minute left, uh, so you will have this uh, yes. one minute to give my last week. Okay. So, it's a comment about how we improve uh, the contribution of African mathematicians, right? In the world, um, yes. Yeah. In the world wide, yeah. So first, we, we have to improve the, the 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 research capacity in Africa, which is which is a problem, which is lacking in most of our universities. The, most what we do is teaching, is so you have tons and of hours of teaching to do research, and there's no research funding. There's no even motivation to do research. So this is this is one way, one thing we have to try to overcome. How do we how do we overcome this? You know, um. So. We should see how we can make our our our, our leadership, uh, political leaders, and even industrial leaders to, to prioritize research, and therefore collaborate with with with, 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 with universities in such a way that that would help uh, boost research in our universities. And I think it it could should go both ways. Either we researchers, our African should, researchers should also be motivated to see how can we approach industry and get them. To, to invest in our research, show them that what uh, they are researching us is also applicable to what the problems people are working on in industry. I think industry didn't see the link between university. They didn't see the link between university work and what they are doing. So one 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 thing is so how to, 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 to collaborate and communicate with these people and create collaboration, but also there should be a, a, a conscious effort from the top 
that would try to, uh, because most of our universities are, are public universities. Governments should invest in research in these universities, I think. Uh, thank you. So uh, before, so uh, indeed, so maybe you are right. So uh, you are, all of you are right. Indeed, we need collaboration. We need to go to the industry. So we need to go to the politician. We need to also apply for funding. This is also true. So as I've said, and uh, I think also collaboration brings uh, a lot of things for scientists. For uh, as far as I know, for a scientific, uh, for, for, for a research group or whatsoever to, to develop, you need uh, internal uh, collaboration, but external collaborations as well. And of course, in Africa, I think we also need to increase uh, our capacity to collaborate between each other. Uh, and of course, as you see, this global gathering is a, is a clear platform where I know here, Professor Samuel Amwalili, and, I, and, and, and it's clear that maybe from this discussion we may collaborate, and also other interesting panel. So I think this is a ground in which maybe we start developing uh, different projects uh, also between Africans and also with other people in order to develop our contribution uh, of mathematics, of our research in the world.